When Rick shoots from the hip, sometimes he hits a bullseye. Sometimes he misses the damn target. And that costs us money, and I hate losing money. Hey, what's going on, guys, and welcome back. We post videos daily, so if you don't want to miss an upload, consider giving this video a thumbs up if you're a fan of Pawn Stars, join the notification squad by subscribing and hitting that bell notification on, but also, don't forget to comment down below saying I subscribed to enter our monthly shoutouts, and we'll make sure to reply and thank as many of you as we possibly can. Hope you enjoyed the video. While the old man Rick, Corey and Chumley have had dozens and dozens of interesting items go through their hands over the course of 16 seasons, not every deal they made turned out to be as good as it appeared to be at first sight. Sometimes, the guys at the gold and silver pawn shop followed their hearts rather than minds and gut feeling despite all the red flags and other warning signs. Blindly putting money on the line obviously comes with a cost, so stay tuned as we look into 6 times the pawn stars broke their bank account, from fake items and bad buys to overpriced goods and purchases that should have never happened. In the season 6 episode Say It Ain't So, Rick made a doomed gamble without consulting his expert buddies when a seller came into the shop carrying a book that had supposedly been signed by baseball legend Joe Jackson, nicknamed Shoeless Joe, who played Major League Baseball in the early part of the 20th century. The nickname came when Jackson endured blisters on his foot from a new pair of cleats, and they hurt so much that he had to take his shoes off. As the play continued, a heckling fan noticed Jackson running to third base in his socks and shouted, You shoeless son of a gun you, and the resulting nickname Shoeless Joe stuck with him throughout the remainder of his life. Anyway, Rick was pretty excited when he saw the book and speculated it could be the rarest sports signature period, since the player was illiterate. Throughout the appraisal, it seemed that Rick followed his heart rather than his mind, as he couldn't have been more excited. Disregarding his own reservations, as well as a questionable certificate of authenticity, Rick eventually shelled out $13,000. It was only after spending all that money that he decided to pay his book expert Rebecca a visit. Rebecca informed him that the signature was most likely fake, so Rick went for a second opinion from an authenticator who backed Rebecca's claim, saying that the signature is not only a fake, but also a ridiculously bad one. <laughs> Great job, son. While there were documented occasions when Shoeless Joe actually signed his name, this book was apparently not one of them and it burned a $13,000 hole in the Pawn Stars bank account. In the second season episode titled Helmet Head, a customer came in bringing a 1964 Austin Healey Sprite, a small British sports car designed to fit in bike sheds which originally cost about 1800 bucks. According to the owner, the car was generally in a very good condition and just needed some minor tuning up. Even though the car wouldn't start when Rick wanted to take it for a spin, he decided to make an offer since Austin Healey's are popular collector's items in the US. The owner wanted to sell it for $10,000, but Rick beat him down and eventually bought it for just half of that. It seemed like a good deal at the time, but when Rick took the car to his friend looking for a simple fix in order to resell it at a higher price, he got some rather bad news. Instead of the $300 or $400 tune-up that Rick had been hoping for, he came to know that it would cost him about $6,000 to fix the car, so one grand more that he had paid for to begin with. When this thing didn't start, I should have told him to call a tow truck. Instead, I gave him five grand. This could be one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. Knowing that he had made a huge mistake, Rick obviously wasn't looking forward to telling the old man, and for a good reason. Although no money was lost yet, as Rick decided to just try to sell the Austin Healey in the condition it was in, the old man clearly was far from happy about the screw up. When Rick shoots from the hip, sometimes he hits a bullseye, sometimes he misses the damn target, and that costs us money and I hate losing money. There are a few collectibles in modern pop culture that are as cool as guitars. Rare ones, especially those played by famous artists and music legends, usually have a lot of history and their value only increases over the years. Back in Season 8, Rick got his hands on a sweet 1961 Fender Stratocaster, one of the most iconic rock guitars in history, when a studio musician called Vic Flick came to the shop. While the man's name doesn't ring a bell, his work certainly does. It turned out that Vic played the guitar riff for the James Bond theme song on this exact guitar that he brought to the shop. Other familiar songs that the guitar was used in the recording of include Ringo's theme from the classic Beatles film A Hard Day's Night, so naturally, the guitar fascinated Rick from the get-go as he recalled his early childhood memories of watching legendary Jimi Hendrix playing the iconic guitar. 
Also, the fact that the guitar model has not changed much since Leo Fender, the inventor came up with it back in 54, only strengthened Rick's desire to get it. Rick and Flick struck a deal at $55,000 and shook hands, while the guitar's worth was estimated around $90,000 later on. In the episode titled Free Willy from 2012, a man named John strolled into the gold and silver pawn shop with his heirloom, a supposedly authentic San Francisco Giants uniform allegedly worn by the legendary baseball player Willie Mays in 1961. Corey happened to be behind the counter and was amazed by the uniform straight away, and when he asked John how he got it, the man said that his uncle acquired it in the late 1960s, and when he passed away, his aunt took good care of it and eventually passed it down to him. Corey asked to see some proof of authenticity, but the man couldn't provide it, which prompted Chumley to express his doubt by saying, Just because it was in your family doesn't make it real. Chumley also expressed his doubt that Mace ever wore the uniform, saying that the uniform does not look game-worn. This doesn't look game worn. Willie Mays was a badass. He was sliding around in the dirt and the grass. I imagine there would be a bunch of stains on it. Nevertheless, Corey stated that it looked authentic, and when he asked John how much does he want for it, the man said that he was looking to sell it for $45,000. Saying that he needs some proof before shutting out that kind of money, Corey called in a local memorabilia dealer, Jeremy Brown, of Ultimate Sports Cards and Memorabilia to examine it. Now even though the uniform had all the key details, like the woolen flannel materials, a spot label and the stitching of May's name, as well as his uniform number and measurements, the expert noticed the immaculate condition it was in and suggested that the uniform lacked evidence of game use, ultimately concluding that even though it can be proved that it was a game used jersey, it is a 100% authentic jersey that Willie Mays was issued. In the end Corey decided to go for it and after some haggling bought it for $31,000. The Harrisons eventually failed to resell it with a price tag of $80,000 in their shop, so it was auctioned off two years later for just above $19,000. Now, as it turns out, the uniform was not only an almost $12,000 loss and had never been worn by Mays during a Giants game, it had never even been his uniform in the first place. A day after they sold a totally fake jersey at the auction, the Paw Stars posted a message in their official Twitter account that read, What it looks like when someone tries to sneak something fake past you, accompanied by a photo of the old man with his disapproving stare, the same one he usually treats his immediate family and chumley with. You would think that by the time season 4 was filmed, the Harrisons would have learned that chumley should never, under any circumstances, be left alone and without supervision. Even though more often than not he seems to be the scapegoat when something goes wrong at the shop, it is mostly well deserved. In one of the episodes from season 4, he was minding the shop all alone when a man walked into the shop carrying a vintage Gibson mandolin he picked up at a yard sale. He was hoping to make some money off of it so he could take his family on a trip to Ireland. Thank you. With Rick and Corey out of reach, it was up to Chum to appraise the item. Encouraged by Rick drooling over another mandolin they had in the shop earlier, he decides to go above his purchase limit of $1,000 and seals the deal at $1,500. Even though the mandolin had the decals on the edges and the stamp of the modern script Gibson logo was visible through one of the F-holes, it turned out that it was one of the thousands of fakes that can be found across the US. This is fake as hell, man. I just paid $1,500 for that. Ouch. Unfortunately for Chumley, who was worried about impressing Rick, he lost $1,400 since a friend and music shop owner later estimated the mandolin's worth at just 100 bucks. Each and every one of us has that one favorite movie, TV show, or whatever that holds such a special place in our hearts that we gladly go out of our way to get a piece of memorabilia or a prop related to it. Being a human being just like the rest of us, Rick also has a soft spot for one movie in particular, as we've seen in the episode titled La La Land from season 14 of Pawn Stars, where he behaved quite out of character. Ever since he saw Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory at a young age, Rick has been an avid fan of the movie's title character. The man that came to the shop carrying the props that were used in the movie, a golden egg, a golden ticket, Willy Wonka's hat, Wonka bars, and most important of all, the everlasting gobstopper knew this, and Rick could barely contain himself. That's the real deal? I'm even getting chills holding it. It's like the Hope Diamond. 
The man took advantage of Rick's love for the movie and made it crystal clear right away that Rick is going to have to pay up if he wants just one item from his collection, probably referring to the Gobstopper. I, I gotta stick with $100,000 for the Gobstopper. Reliving childhood memories, Rick stepped out of his usual character and immediately struck a deal with the man without even trying to haggle and without investigating the authenticity of the items. I'm gonna miss that everlasting gobstopper. Sweet! You got a deal. It's like the fountain of youth. I'm seven years old again. Rick bought the Gobstopper believing that the ultimate Willy Wonka prop would bring customers to the shop, but at the end of the day, he got played as the price of the Gobstopper actually ranges from twenty dollars to $40,000. Thank you for checking this video out and don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe for new videos every day. Turn that bell notification on and comment down below that you subscribed and we'll make sure to reply and thank as many of you as we possibly can. Once again thank you for watching and see you next time.